was set up to stop wars. That in itself proves what a failure it has been. There have been continuous wars since the UN's inception in 1945, mostly involving the Western members of the United Nations Security Council, the US, France and the UK. Some examples, Vietnam, Korea, Egypt, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan and a lot, lot more. These Western members of the United Nations Security Council were also the main protagonists in the Great World Wars. Now they have formed themselves into a cartel called the UN Security Council. All of the permanent members are nuclear powers and perhaps their power of veto was merely to ensure that there will be no nuclear war between themselves. And yet today most political commentators would say the world is moving towards a third world war. Recently, Russia and China used their vetoes to ensure that a Western-backed no-fly zone could not be implemented in Syria. This revealed a return to a bipolar world, which is different to the last decade of a unipolar world. The United States is still the single biggest financial contributor to the UN. The UN can easily be seen as a tool of US hegemony. Iraq was crippled by UN sanctions once Iraq proved itself no longer of use to the US. Then when the UN refused to agree to the second Iraq war, the US and Britain simply ignored it. And even when the UN has sanctioned wars, the results have been a wave of war crimes, with mostly innocents being killed and harmed. We only need to look at Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya. The UN has repeatedly broken its own charter, regardless of who is at the helm, whether it was under Kofi Annan or under the current Ban Ki-moon. The UN has no right to condone warfare unless an external threat is exhibited. And again, Afghanistan and Libya are examples where the countries pose no threat to others. Iraq's conquest of Kuwait bothered the West, but that is arguable whether it was provoked or indeed an internal matter ignoring the fact that the US gave its approval in advance. And when Iraq attacked Iran, many Western UNSC members assisted Iraq. So the rules of the UNSC seem to be one of shifting goalposts. Where are the resolutions to protect civilians in Bahrain? Why have so many vetoes been cast on resolutions condemning Israel's treatment of the Palestinians? From 1972 to 1982, the United States made 14 U.S. vetoes on resolutions to protect the Palestinians. From 1982 to 2011, the U.S. gave 28 vetoes. The U.S. was the only member of the United Nations Security Council not to support a resolution condemning Israeli settlements on Friday. As one of five permanent members of the Council with veto power, the U.S. struck down the proposal which would have said Israeli settlements in the West Bank were illegal and would have called for an immediate and complete end to construction. Apart from the self-anointed veto, there are other inherent unfairnesses to many aspects of the U.N. For example, a little South Pacific island has as much voting rights as a large country. We have also seen the distribution of economic wealth amongst countries alter. Germany, Japan, Brazil and India are now major economic powers, yet they have no permanent representation on the Security Council. The UN is based on the belief of democracy that by every country casting a vote the world can be prevented from having tyrants and conflicts. In fact, it is not a true democracy anyway as there are the self-appointed permanent members of the Security Council, which happens to have the right to make binding resolutions as opposed to the General Assembly, which generally can only make non-binding resolutions. The one state, one vote power structure of the General Assembly theoretically allows states comprising just 8% of the world population to pass a resolution by a two-thirds vote. There have been increasing calls for reform of the UN, and virtually all countries recognize the need for this. The UN was set up by the United States after World War II. It was a UN was a creation of the United States. So what do you expect for something that the United States created? You think the United States is just going to turn around and say, oh no, you all can have a fair share of what's going on in the world, you all can take away our power? 
no, America's not going to do that. And as the United States gets more and more desperate, you know, you expect them to be even more vociferous in opposing these things. You know, the Americans got their needs, and one of their needs is to hang on to what they've got. And their empire is crumbling, and then has been a cornerstone of their you know, international control, so I can let the UN get out of their grip. I think you're going to see a collapse of the American government before you see the Americans let the UN go. There have been increasing calls for reform of the UN, and virtually all countries recognize the need for this. Expanding the members of the UNSC is the main focus, but also the complexity of electing members to the UNSC is entwined with regional groups. And the Western European and Others group happens to look like NATO plus Australia. Also, how is it possible for the world's 1.2 billion Muslims not to have a permanent representation on the Security Council? I asked a spokesperson for the UK mission to the United Nations in New York, what is the UK attitude to reform at the UN? And I understand the UK is very much for reform of the UN, and he said, the UK will not give up its permanent seat, nor will it relinquish its veto. We do not believe the veto should be extended to other countries. It is going to take a great deal of ingenuity to get the permanent members of the UN to relinquish or compromise on their exclusive right to a veto. This is the greatest challenge that faces the world.